Quote, In the spring of 1002, Ethelred agreed to marry the sister of the new Norman Duke, Richard II. Her name was Emma. It is difficult, of course, to assess people's personalities, never mind their personal relationships, at a distance of a thousand years. But it is probably fair to say that despite the participation of papal legates, the marriage of Ethelred and Emma was not a match made in heaven. The couple, it is true, got on well enough to produce three children, Edward, the future confessor, his brother Alfred, and their sister, Godgifu. But since Ethelred had six sons by a previous marriage, the production of more male heirs was hardly a top priority. The match with Emma was intended to stop Vikings seeking shelter in Normandy. In this, it signally failed to do. End quote. That was from Mark, a historian Mark Morris, The Norman Conquest. I want to talk about Emma of Normandy. Uh, I've got my friend here. Wow. Um, and he uh, wrote down a list of some topics he'd like to talk about, and I saw on there Emma of Normandy, and I thought, that's interesting, I know a bit about that. The reason was, I was going to do one of these uh, videos on on the Norman Conquest, William the Bastard. But reading around the topic, I find the generation, a couple of generations before, and his immediate successors, much more interesting. Um, the Norman Conquest itself has been done to death. Just when I was researching it, I saw there was yet another version done by Dan Snow coming out. So, um, of all people. Um, mm. Because I find it interesting that certain people will make up r fictional characters from history, like shield maidens, mm. when in fact history is littered with great women. Yeah. Um, there's loads. Yeah. You know, Margaret of Anjou springs to mind. They're outnumbered, but the ones who are... Uh... Some of them shine very brightly. Margaret Beaufort, Elizabeth Woodville. Elizabeth I. Of course, yeah. Victoria. Yeah, there's, there, there are tons. But that's just to speak of royal like, and aristocrats as well. Yeah. Well, behind nearly every great male figure in history, there's a woman. Or more than one, sometimes. But Emma of Normandy, I haven't seen a great... You know, like, Philippa Gregory has written lots of fictional novels about women from history, so medieval... But um, Emma of Normandy, I think, has uh, been... Because it's pre-conquest, yeah. it's uh, sort of left behind a little bit. Yeah, that um, seems to be treated as a watershed moment in her history. Yeah. It doesn't have to be. Yeah. But also about Emma, isn't there like not many sources, and not particularly clear sources about... Yeah, absolutely. That is one of the problems. Um, uh, one one book I've, I was reading, well, listening to the audio version of... Um, said that, uh, that the guy who wrote it said he'd done another book about Edward I. And for Edward's the first reign, there's so much documentation that you can account for where Edward is for nearly every single day of his reign, which is decades long. Right. Um, you can, historians can say exactly where he was, almost. Uh, but for William the Conqueror, um, apparently, they can only say for certain where he was, for something like... Uh, a few dozens of days throughout his entire adult life. We don't really know exactly where he was. What they had, if there was like a royal charter or a royal decree, you, and it would say where and when it was issued from, and it was signed by the king, so you could say he was definitely there. So and, and a, that's, few, a few fixed points. So, yeah, exactly. There's a few fixed points like that, and otherwise we don't really know a great deal. And so, yeah, you ask about the sources... I know that one of the major sources for her, or the main one, was the encomium. Yeah, the encomium is in praise of Queen Emma. Yeah, and um, that was written somewhat later. Well, it was commissioned during by her during her life. Oh, okay. <laughs> but they think, they're oh. almost certain that it was revised as events changed. She commissioned her own encomium. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> fine, fine. And it's not, by historians, like modern historians know that it's completely... Uh, biased right, and everything. Right, right. Uh, the encomium M.A. Regina, yeah, which basically in praise of Queen Emma. Right. But yeah, the, you've also got, uh, well, there's obviously Bayeux Tapestry, although that's slightly later, it doesn't have Emma in it at all. She's already dead by the time the Bayeux Tapestry starts. But there's various sort of Norman chroniclers. There's William of Jumierge. There's um, Robert Wace. Shout out to any Wace fans out there. I'm a big Wace head myself. Going out to the uh, waste crew. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, there's uh, John of Worcester. Um, he's a guy whose accounts of 
survived. There's uh, Wolfstan, the Bishop of, of Worcester. <laughs> there's Alderic Vitalis, who's a bit later. And then there's uh, Ralph Glaber, another Norman chronicler. Uh, but the main one was, of course, we've got the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. But the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle you have to be a bit careful with because then it, it omits a lot of things. And um, there's different versions, and some are sort of pro one faction and some are pro another faction. Um, so you've, you've got to be careful with it. But it is sort of the backbone of, if you're studying this sort of thing, it's the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. So the historicity of these people, of the people of that period, was, was less good than than, well, everything after the, the conquest. Yeah, it gets better mm. after the conquest, yeah. So, and, uh, she, and she wasn't the holder of the crown herself. She was queen consort for two different kings. Right? Yeah, well, we'll come to all that. But I mean, but, I mean, the historicity of someone like Ethelred, would, you would expect to be a bit better because he was king himself. Yeah, yeah. but there's no uh, equivalent of the encomium for Ethelred. But the Chronicle talks about it all. I've heard it said that, you know, uh, historians studying this period can fit all the primary material on one bookshelf easily. Like everything there is to be read, you know. Right. So, so a good historian um, could read all that in a week. <laughs> well, I don't know about that exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, in, in, in 1002, the King Ethelred marries Emma. And she's young. She's only about 17 or 18 at this point. Um, and she is the auntie of the future William the Conqueror, who isn't born yet. She's got two brothers, a Richard and a Robert. And their father is Richard, Duke Richard. And when he dies, a bit later in the story, jumping ahead a little bit, but when he dies, the eldest son, Richard II, becomes Duke. But within a couple of years, he's murdered by his younger brother, Robert, who is William the Conqueror's dad. So Emma, Emma of Normandy, is William the Conqueror's aunt. Right. Her brother was his grandfather. Uh, was his sorry? Dad. Her brother was his father. Yeah. And would Normandy have been independent of France at that time? Yeah, absolutely. So Normandy was, uh, yeah, completely independent from the kings of France. There was no king of France actually at this point. They were just Rex Francorum. The monarchs didn't style themselves king of France for another couple of hundred years. So yeah, there was no France as such. There was no kingdom of France. There was no king of France. There was. The Frankish kingdoms, Charlemagne, a couple of hundred years before this, had had a, his empire, which had broken up. And so and, like West Francia, East Francia. Yeah, so... Lothar, Lotharingia. So a lot of what we think of as the Kingdom of France, even in the early medieval period, is actually sort of West Francia. Okay. And Normandy had been... So, so a part of that was the sort of county or duchy of or a place called Neustria and Vikings came down obviously from Scandinavia under a lord called Rollo and just invade this bit of Frankish land called Neustria and there's nothing that the the kings of France so to speak could do about it they weren't they didn't have the military power to stop them and over very quickly over a couple of generations these Vikings make themselves much more Frankish. They take up Christianity. They call themse- start calling themselves things like Richard and William and Robert instead of Scandinavian Viking names. Right. And the kings of France start depending on them as muscle and they start marrying into the royal line. And that all happens very quickly. And they, they, they start building in the sort of European Romanesque fashion and sort of drop a lot of their, you know, start speaking... French and writing in Latin instead of Scandinavian languages, so they very quickly assimilate. So there, in that, you have the beginning of a long interweaving of English and French history, then, because the Normans obviously kept interacting with the English. Uh huh. Yeah. So Emma of Normandy, when she's fairly young, about seventeen or eighteen, gets married to the the King of England, Ethelred, um, and it's that's obviously you know uh, a big step up. Even then, England was one of the richest states if you could even call them that at that point, proto-states in Europe, certainly in Western Europe. It was known for being very rich, and it was quite stable, relatively stable. Um, they had coinage, a lot of places didn't even have any coinage yet. It was well worth raiding. Oh, definitely worth raiding, yeah. Uh, but to become queen, and she was married to Ethelred in the spring of, of, of 1002, is you know a massive step up. She was just the daughter of a duke, albeit a powerful duke, 
And now she's the Queen of England. Hmm. But something else happened in 1002. On the 13th of November 1002, is a, a huge massacre took place. The St. Bryce's Day Massacre. You heard of that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So Ethel Of Danes, of Danish... That's Danish. right, yeah. So a bit of the background to that, well, what it was, was that the king, Ethelred, ordered that every Dane in the entire land was to be killed. Um, now, historians think that it's not actually possible to have done that. Um, so that didn't actually happen 100%. <laughs> Certainly in the north of England was, um, you know, Danish-held lands. Quite, and Quite a lot of it. Yeah, yeah, they held York and stuff. So, and I think there's possibly not really many killings up there at all but but the bit of the background to that is that <laughs> the vikings had been invading on and off for hundreds of years un- under alfred starting with like lindisfarne and things like that and then under alfred they were kicked out booted out uh, a sort of proto navy was formed to help defend our shores but over the next 100 years or so they came back more and more strongly and bigger and bigger forces, more and more organised, more and more intent on staying, not just raiding. Right. Um, until we come up to the days of Ethelred when it was sort of crazy, the policy of paying the money, Danegeld, to not raid anymore doesn't really work. They just realise they can just come back if you, you keep doing more, that. Right. It's like negotiating with terrorists sort of thing. Um, mm. Mm. It's counterproductive. And it was just getting ridiculous where the Vikings were just... Well, they say that they think maybe Ethelred had had intelligence that the Vikings were... Or the Danes were on the verge of, you know, attempting a coup or something like that. And so his hand was maybe forced. Why would you do something so drastic otherwise? But we don't really know that for sure. What we do know is that in in 13th of November 1002, this massacre took place, including some of the Vikings' royal family that were over here. Right. Uh, which pissed them off no end. So the king of Norway, the top Viking at the time, was uh, Swain Forkbeard. Um, and I believe uh, someone in his family, his sister or someone, was killed in this yeah. massacre. Yeah. Um, and that was, you know, red rag to a bull. So he probably would have wanted to invade anyway because that seems what they all wanted for a period of 300 odd years. And this was just the perfect excuse. It was a richer place than Denmark, right? It was worth taking. Yeah. So after that, the raiding, the the, the king, uh, the, the the Viking king, Swain Forkbeard, doesn't actually come over for a few years yet. Um, the world moves a lot slower in those days. We're used to war kicking off and things happening straight away, but that's not how it was then. Sometimes whole years can pass between declaring war and something happening. Um... Uh, and in those intervening years, before he does actually come over, the raiding just gets more and more over the top. In 1006, one version of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle writes this about the Vikings, uh, that they, quote, did as they had want to do. They harried, burned and slew as they went. The people of Winchester, which was the capital at the time, could watch an arrogant and confident host passing their gates on its way to the coast, bringing provisions and treasures from a distance of more than 50 miles inland, end quote. So it's not just raiding anymore. It's starting to take the whole thing. Yeah, um, ransacking the whole country. Yeah, yeah. In 1011, for example, the Vikings really start taking the piss. They come up the Thames, capture the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, and then try and sell him back to the crown. <laughs> This goes on for like a year or so, and they can't really agree anything. So they murdered him, just like by just like throwing bones at him, <laughs> or just had some skulls around, and they just sort of stoned him to death with that <laughs> in a, in a during a drinking bout. Classic Viking stuff. And we don't know. Am I right in saying we don't know whether Swain was a pagan or a Christian? No, he was Christian. Um, the Vi- the Vikings were mainly Christian by this point. That's one of the things, when I get onto Canute in a moment, Rome and other places in Europe all thought that he was a godless heathen and were all pleasantly surprised, sort of, to discover that he was Christian. Right. To be perfectly honest, I'm not sure if Swain Falkbeard was fully... Well, they weren't all fully Christian. They certainly weren't Christians as we know it in any way, shape or form. 
But this is sort of the period where you could be both a a pagan and a Christian. They're encouraging all the pagan world to convert, so they would they would be glad you were at least putting on a show of it. Sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, paying lip service sometimes was enough. Was worth something. Mm -hmm. Um, There's there's accounts from earlier period, slightly earlier period than from this, when if the Anglo Saxons would win a battle and take lots of Vikings hostage or captured capture them, they would sort of force them to convert. Uh, like a mass conversion ceremony um, and then let them go in the end because you don't kill necessarily murder other freeborn Christians and so some Vikings found themselves being forced to convert to Christianity multiple times and as soon as they got away they would just revert back to their old ways but um, it, it was a funny period when you could be more than one thing at once and anyway they weren't the same sort of Christians as we would think of as Christians yeah yeah, they weren't meek <laughs> so in the end in uh, 1013 Swain Forkbeard the, the top Viking comes over and uh, yeah lays waste to Anglo-Saxon England basically um, he's successful in his attempt to invade England Ethelred and his all his children and Emma his wife uh, all have to flee and they go, or Ethelred himself, first goes to the Isle of Wight and then to Normandy. But they all end up in Normandy one way or the other. That was 1013. This is in 1013, yeah. And so the Vikings have, for the first time, successfully invaded, fully invaded and captured England. The capital is in Winchester, not London. And the in old Hampshire. minster there is in Hampshire, yeah. yeah. Have you ever been there? I've never been there. No. 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 Quite like to go actually. Yeah. Probably quite nice. <laughs> yeah. So the treasury was there, and the old minster was there where you, people were often crowned and kings buried. Some saints are buried there, and Swain Forkbeard captures it, but then dies just promptly dies. <laughs> right. Not long after, like I think weeks after that, he just dies, and that happens loads. There doesn't seem to be any foul play. In those days, even if he was a completely healthy, fully grown man you get something, you catch something, an infection or anything, and if you don't fight it off, that's it, you die. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> as simple as that. Mm. And so that, that just happens loads, especially in this story, actually. So when uh, Forkbeard just pops his clogs, um, there's various factions, some that want to keep the Viking regime going, uh, but a lot that would want to see the old, the old regime back, and that's what happens. They sort of get the upper hand this faction, and the Viking, what's left of the Viking army, goes back to Scandinavia, and Ethelred and his family come back. Now, one thing, I, one character I sh- need to mention really is a, uh, Ethelred's sort of right-hand man. He's what you might call a chancellor in later years, or a, a prime minister, or something like that. Um, uh, a guy called Edric, Edric the Grabber, sometimes Edric the Grasper. A Saxon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he seems to have been... Nobody liked him. All the accounts just paint him as just an evil, duplicitous, sort of worm-tongue type guy. Venal. Yeah, yeah, venal's a good word, yeah. Um, The Encomium isn't a fan. Um, The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, none of them are fans. Because, yeah, he's he's, he's a backstabber. Um, But... Well, all the uh, bad things that go on under Ethelred's reign are sort of blamed on him. As I'm sure you know, Ethelred's epithet is the unready. That doesn't mean that he's necessarily unready for something. It comes from his, what he was called at the time, which was unraid, which means to be poorly advised. And wasn't it a pun on Ethelred as well? Yeah, and, it, and as well, it was a pun on his, on his Christian name as well. Which means well-read or well Advised, apparently. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So it's Ethelred the Unraid, which meant... It was like well-read, the poorly read. <laughs> the well-advised, poorly advised. Yeah. Mm. And it's this Edric the Grasper character, Edric the Grabber, who's to blame, it seems, for a lot of that. Right. Um, and when, they, when the magnates of England sort of call Ethelred back from Normandy, they say, look, you know, we're happy for you to reign, but you've got to not be a piece of shit and do everything Edric tells you to do. 
And he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. But then went straight back to the old ways, put Edric right at the top again, and people were unhappy. Yeah, it sounds like Ethelred was like something of a scoundrel from when he was young all the way, all, all his life, it sounds to me. Yeah, I get the impression that he's both a little bit weak, but also has been dealt a, a fairly shit hand, um, the period that he's in. It's going to be tough. It's extremely difficult. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, unless you're an Alfred the Great type figure or an Alexander, mm. you're probably going to get trampled over eventually. <laughs> a bigger fish will come along at some point. Uh, that's what I feel like. I, some, I feel a little bit sorry for him and a little bit completely not at the same time, you know? Yeah. It's one of those, it's, it's, it's a hard figure to sort of get a grasp on because we haven't got, you know, really good accounts of... Well, I think some accounts describe him as being like violent when he was younger. And everyone was violent, it seems. <laughs> there, no, everyone. I mean, there, there were no I mean, wishy-washy goody. But type. people of that time remarked upon him right, in okay. particular. Right. Right. But hmm. yeah, when was the Battle of Malden? Well, the Battle of Malden was nine ninety one, I believe. Oh, that was under. It was under, Edgar, was it? No, I think Ethelred was Ethelred was the king. This king, oh, okay. um, but I don't think he was there. And that, apparently, the Battle of Malden was the first time that the Vikings turned up to have a full pitched battle and oh, won. won. Mm. Um, and apparently the English army was really overconfident. They assumed they would win easily for some reason and didn't. <laughs> and that was sort of, in a way, some historians have said, the beginning of the end. So Ethelred's second bite of the cherry, so to speak, is... Is, is not good. It, nothing really goes well and it doesn't last all that long. His own son, he's got loads of sons, as I mentioned earlier. Sort of the, the oldest, most powerful one is uh, Edmund, and Edmund Ironside. Um, and by 1015, he's actually in revolt against his own dad. But the son of Swain Forkbeard has not forgotten that he's got a legitimate, well, not legitimate, but he's got a claim to the English throne. And he comes over the next year in 1016. He's got a claim to usurp the throne. Yeah, to <laughs> re-usurp the throne. <laughs> and that's Canute. That's the, the famous Canute. He's the son of Swain. And he's come to get what he says anyway. He's rightly his. And during this time, Ethelred just dies. <laughs> it just seems he's, he's old and he's a bit beaten. And he just dies. Again, no suggestion of foul play, I don't think. It's just... People die quite quickly. You know, we're used to a world where people might be ill for many years or battle with a disease for mm. many years and might overcome it. It's yeah, n- get over one. It's one. like, no, you get something and it kills you. So then there's a, 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 a struggle between Ed, this Edmund Ironside and Canute, the Viking. And there's, there's many battles, but the, the main one, the decisive one, is the Battle of Assenden in 1016 and we don't know a great deal about it we're not even sure if that's even the right battle you know we're in the dark ages but the so-called battle of Assenden sees Edmund defeated and Canute victorious and maybe Edmund actually um, wounded because he dies as well not long after we're not sure whether it was from wounds or not but he sort of conveniently dies Edric the Grabber switched sides, apparently, <laughs> at a key moment, over to Canute, because he saw the, the, the way it was going. Ugh. But he gets him to come up and because what Canute does once he wins, once he becomes King of England and gets himself crowned in Winchester, like a good Anglo-Saxon, is he has a purge, basically, especially of the upper classes. And um, Edric the Grasper is among one of those who's killed. Um, executed and um, apparently the Anglo I haven't read it myself but apparently Anglo-Saxon Chronicles uh, sort of crow over that they're like happy to see him finally get his comeuppance he should have seen that coming by the sounds of it he should have known that was coming to him well yeah I, I always wonder that sort of thing even when he watched something like Goodfellas how are these guys how do, how do you not know that it's going to come <laughs> and bite you in the ass at some point how do you mm. not <laughs> mm-hmm. let alone being like um in this period where political assassinations were rife. Yeah, I guess once you're in that game, it's either run away and try and become anonymous or just deal with it and play the game until you lose. 
Hmm. You know, I don't know. <laughs> but Canute got himself the crown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Canute is now, and he's, he does hold it for many years. And he was... 20 odd years. Probably somewhat serious about being a Christian as well, right? Yeah, so as I said earlier, um, Rome was pleasantly surprised to discover that he was a Christian because he sent them some gifts and stuff. And that story about the tide was a little display of his piety, wasn't it? Yeah, so the story of Canute and the tide is a funny one. It's been used as sort of propaganda by later historical... Well, not propaganda, but it's been twisted in many ways. So the story is... Or oh, do you want to tell it? What the, the, no, the, the uh, popular version is that he stood in the in on the shore, or you know where the waves were lapping up, and commanded the tide to turn back, or commanded the waves to stop. But knowing that they wouldn't. Well, that's the real that's the real story. It's yeah, to yeah. show his humility, but it's been used the other way to show that he was stupid <laughs> or insane or yeah, 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 just yeah. or just pathetic, like, like how Xerxes was supposed to have had the Hellespont whipped. <laughs> For um, for insubordination, for daring to destroy one of his bridges, like that's just stupid, isn't it? Like childish. Um, so the Canute story has been used to uh, show, but yeah, it was actually to say, look, I'm just a man. Who do you think I am? Yeah, because because he was surrounded by sycophants or or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so he has uh, Canute has more or less decapitates the Anglo-Saxon. Uh, aristocracy. Who sought out who more, him or Emma? Oh, because they they then get married. They then get married. Well, we don't know. We think possibly that it was the the Duke of Normandy, her brother. It was like a power play. It's like, well, okay, the reality now is that Ethelred's dead, Edmund's dead, Canute is the king, undisputedly. We've got to deal with that. How best to do that? So probably the reality was that the Duke of Normandy would want it. Right. And it seems Canute himself wanted it because he needed to have legitimacy. He needed to... There's two ways to reign, isn't there, if you usurp or conquer a people. Yeah. You can either grind them under your jackboot. Like the bastard. Yeah, exactly like the bastard. Or yeah. like the Nazis in Poland. <laughs> yeah. Or you can try and assimilate, like Rollo did in Normandy. And try everything you can to sort of please the peoples that you're now find yourself the ruler of. And maybe even deliberately go native. Yeah. Yeah. Alexander was accused of that, of going a bit too Persian. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Canute's tactic was to, was to try and ass- assimilate. Um, so, for whatever reason, he decides a good way to do that would be to try and marry... Ethelred's widow, Emma. And that was probably useful as well. Well, almost certainly. Well, yeah, She would have had everyone. her own courtiers and stuff, wouldn't she? To everyone, yeah. I've got another quote from Mark Morris here. Amidst all the carnage, there was one notable survivor, Edward's mother, Emma, who contributed to the stability of the new regime in England in a wholly different way. As the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle explains, can you ordered the widow of the late King Ethelred to be fetched as his wife. This makes it sound as if Emma had little personal choice in the matter, which is probably the case. A Norman chronicler writing not long afterwards casually reports that she was captured in London by Canute in the course of his conquest. Emma herself would later tell a different story, one which implied she had returned to Normandy after Ethelred's death and was wooed back to Canute with promises and presents. As we will see in due course, Emma's own testimony is riddled with half-truths and outright liars, so there is good reason to discount her version. Whichever way it happened, though, willingly or no, Emma became Queen of England for a second time, providing a sense of continuity at Canute's court, but in the process, abandoning her children to a life of cross-channel exile. End quote. So her children from Ethelred would stay in Normandy and be powerless. That's right, yeah, and those children are... Edward the Confessor, who becomes later becomes Edward the Confessor, uh, his younger brother and Alfred, and they've got a sister as well. Got good food. So the story, a lot of most histories sort of concentrate fairly heavily on Edward the Confessor because he is so important for the story of William the Conqueror, which all historians are endlessly fascinated in. So at this point, quite often 
the historians just concentrate on what happens to Edward, but are more interested in Emma. Mm-hmm. She abandons her, those those three kids like pretty much wholesale. Um, in fact, she more or less abandons Normandy. Um, later in her life, she has an option to go to Normandy or not, and she doesn't choose to go there. Um, I'll talk about that when we get to it, but um, it seems she, by this point in her life, by the time she gets remarried to Canute, she's really pay, playing power politics for herself in her own yeah, right. You like mentioned that Wikipedia... I haven't read her Wikipedia page, but you said the Wikipedia page says she's got her own lands at this point. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, that totally yeah, makes sense because... And, yeah. the, and the city of Exeter apparently belongs to her. And, and also, later, um, it's made explicitly clear, it's said explicitly clearly in the accounts that she has a fortune and treasures of her own. And it sounds like when Canute got in, she saw new opportunities. Well, they... A way to be someone, like, to continue being someone. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Well, she'd gone from... To be something even greater. Cause... She'd gone from the Queen of England to just a dethroned queen, which is terrible. And now she became Queen and of England, she... Denmark, and some... Like, more and, well. and Norway, yeah, eventually, yeah. So Canute's empire... Uh, grows more after this. But yeah, he becomes sort of a pan-Scandinavian British monarch with a, 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 a mini-empire. Mini yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, he, 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 he gets in in 1016, and it's around 1027... Sorry, 1028, he, or his armies anyway, uh, conquer Denmark. And so, yeah, he's got Norway, Denmark, and England at that point. Right. So he's sort of... He is one of the most powerful people in Europe. Absolutely. Uh, It's in 1027 that he he actually went to Rome on a pilgrimage. Now, when that happens, it speaks of a relatively stable situation back home. Otherwise, you can't get away with that. You know, if there's a civil war going on or even the threat of one or the threat of an invasion, you're not going to just take a year out or five years out or whatever it was to... Uh, to go on a, a big pilgrimage, he didn't go all the way to um, to Jerusalem and the the Holy Sepulchre, but he went to Rome, and maybe Emma went with him at least some of the way. But it's also un- because because Canute's reign is long, twenty odd years. England, the land of the Angles, Angleland, <laughs> it's not truly England even yet. Um, Angleland <laughs> was changed a lot in that twenty years. One of the things was that when Canute first invaded successfully, he, as I mentioned, purged the aristocracy or the elderman, that was sort of the highest rank you could be below king, um, and put in his own, put Vikings in there, members of his own family. Um, but over that 20 years, they had been replaced by a new breed of British rulers. So, for example, we put like one of his brothers in control of the north but then he died, he put someone else really close to him, a Viking, in control of everything south of the Thames, and then later he revolted and he had to have him. So, towards the end of Canute's reign, he's actually got very few Vikings in, he's, in I mean, control. Right, so it's so below the, the monarchy, Yeah. it's still in loads of ways an Anglo-Saxon kingdom. Uh, not yeah, not but, a kingdom, but... Um, a set of kingdoms. Right. Yeah. Um, and they're called, and their title was Jarl, right? Or Earl. Isn't that right? Uh, well, uh, no, that's a bit later. Um, well, oh. Eldermen. Eldermen, sorry. Yeah. So the way the uh, society was set up, or the way historians have sort of <laughs> painted the picture of it, anyway, whether it's 100% accurate is something else, but they paint a picture of you have the, the king at the top, who may be sort of an over king of some other smaller kings. You know, so you might have a kingdom of Wessex, the kingdom of Northumbria, and the kingdom of Mercia, let's say. Petty kings. Um, or, you know, or, or, or at one point, famously, there were seven kingdoms. Um, I think it's a bit of what the uh, Game of Thrones is taken from. This is a couple of hundred years before what we're talking about now. So you'd have the king or kings at the top, under them eldermen, under them thanes. Um, so thanes are mentioned in Macbeth and stuff. Right. And under that, uh, Charles, which are sort of free p- 
people, but lowly, sort of peasants, but free. And then under that, you've got slaves. There were slaves in Britain at this time, in England, or in all of Europe, in fact. Uh, slavery was quite widespread. Again, from Mark Morris's The Norman Conquest, quote, At a fundamental level, these people were divided into two categories, the free and the unfree. Although many books on the Anglo-Saxons do not say much about it, more than 10% of England's population were slaves. Slavery was a widespread institution in early medieval Europe, and the sale and export of slaves was one of the main motors of the economy. Since the 9th century, the trade's most outstanding exponents had been the Vikings, whose warfare was predicated for the most part on seizing young men and women as merchandise to be sold either at home in Scandinavia or, very commonly, to Arab merchants in the Middle East. England was one of their principal hunting grounds, so individuals abducted from the coasts of Devon, Wales or Northumbria might eventually find themselves labouring under a desert sun to construct a caliph's palace, or members of a sultan's harem, end quote. When William of Normandy does finally come along and invade in 1066, uh, they do do away with slavery, pretty much wholesale, from an actual sort of uh, Christian perspective. They sort of called themselves reformed, uh, a reformed church, and they took slavery fairly seriously and didn't like it. Plus, the reality of slavery is that it doesn't actually produce great profits. Um, you obviously get entirely free labour until that slave dies, but you've got to entirely feed them and house them for their whole life. And so it's it's better to just pay someone a wage, and uh, it's actually more profitable to do that, which is what the Normans discovered. And I would have thought manpower would be a consideration at that time as well, right? Like, if you want to raise armies, you want a larger population, right? It's just more... Yeah. More men you can call upon. For. Yeah. I would have thought that would be another reason to get rid of slavery as well, especially if it was just... if it, Yeah, if it wasn't making you much money anyway. Mm. I mean, it was just a way for the, for obviously the raiders to make money. Yeah, that's like money for nothing, money for old rope almost, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, as I say, there's uh, a, a, a new sort of upper class of Anglo-Saxon rulers um, that are, are not royal in any way. So under Canute, there's sort of three big earls, or now they're earls, earldermen. There's one called Leofric, one called Seawood, and one called Godwin. And all of them are basically peasants, or sons of like petty bourgeois peasants, that sort of thing. Uh, but they're sort of uh, strong characters, you know, uh, have come up through the ranks through their own merits almost. And it seems like Canute was happy, well, not happy, but was okay to let Anglo-Saxons take over the reigns because it smoothed the way for his reign you know right, right. but of the three Godwin is sort of the most powerful he's basically inherited or taken over what was the royal house of Wessex everything south of the Thames basically so what had been Ethelred's kingdom even Alfred the Great's kingdom of Wessex is now being controlled by this Godwin this son of a peasant but he's a, a, a really strong character he comes through as a badass individual you know <laughs> no no two ways about that you, you, you can't walk all over him so um but he uh, Canute has basically made Godwin his second in command he's basically the second most powerful guy in the kingdom and um Emma doesn't like him um the encomium isn't warm to him um and he's probably one of the most powerful Anglo-Saxons there has ever been up until this point as well because before this, there were always smaller kingdoms. Um, you know, there's one or two characters like Alfred the Great, who, you know, you could argue, had similar levels of authority or power. Or more authority, but not necessarily as much power. But So Godwin is sort of the main guy. Now, this Godwin is, in fact, the father of Harold Godwinson, who gets the arrow in the eye in 1066. I'm not going to go into that Harold hardly at all, because we're talking about Emma here. But this Godwin is Harold's dad, Okay, so throughout this time when Emma and Canute are married, they have a couple of kids, uh, a boy, Harthur Canute, son of Canute, Harthur Canute, and a daughter called Gunhilda. Which is a Germanic name, like an Anglo-Saxon name, right? 
Gunhilda. Is that? Well, I don't know, but it sounds that? more Viking to me. Oh, okay. Okay. Because um, I mean, Anglo-Saxon names are, yes, yes. or female names are, a bit weird. Well, so let me explain. Um, before he was married to Emma, it's they think we're not sure because it's the Dark Ages. <laughs> we think that in ten thirteen, when he came over with his dad, Swain Forkbeard, and first invaded. He married a woman then, an Anglo-Saxon woman, and her name was Elfgifu. Ah. Elfgifu of Northampton. Now, that's a classic Anglo-Saxon female name, Elfgifu. Hmm. Um, Gunhilda, to me, sounds more Scandinavian, but I'm not sure. I'm not Gun sounds Scandinavian. Yeah. Hilda. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think um, Anglo-Saxon names are great. There's a lot of, you know, Athelred, Edred... You have, to, Stan, you have to change the alphabet Ethelbert, a bit as well to write to write their names. Don't you? Ebert, yeah, yeah. Radwold. So. And their language sounds like we can't understand it that well. Like no, not at all. But it sounds kind of uh, something familiar about it, doesn't it? Like? I don't know. I've heard people speak Anglo-Saxon, and this completely alien to me. There's a few words the same. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. That's right. The odd word. And the sound of it isn't so different from ours. I don't know. It sounds to me... I don't know. It sounds like a Scandinavian dialect to me, if I'm honest. Anglo-Saxon? Yeah. Well, it's Germanic, and Scandinavian's like another branch of Germanic, and it's like North Germanic. Like The Germanic peoples, I think, come from the original wellspring of, of Scandinavia. Germania included both all of Germany and all of Scandinavia. Germania, the greater Germania. Yeah. yeah. About which you can't say very much for sure, can you? But well, Tacitus has got a book on it. Hmm. Might actually do a video on that one day. Okay. So in 1035, Canute dies. Just again, sort of out of nowhere. No suggestion of foul play, particularly. Hmm. I mean, in all these things, he, that these people may have been poisoned. <laughs> but um, we, you know, we don't know. That no one, none of the accounts say. He was. So it seems he was, uh, he just fell ill or something and died. Now, whenever that happens in the Dark Ages or early Middle Ages, um, if there's not a really, really obvious, clear line of succession, then uh, chaos is going to ensue. And it did. <laughs> it did. Uh, because Canute had sons, Ace, well, he had sons by this Elfgifu of Northampton this sort of semi-illegitimate marriage before his proper marriage to Emma. This elf crew had two sons, a Swain, another Swain, and a Harold, um, known later as Harold Harefoot. So in this period, it's not surprising that it ends up with a William and Harold fighting each other. There's loads and loads of Normans are called William, Robert and Richard. Loads and loads of Anglo-Saxons and, and Vikings are called Harold. Loads. It's a really, really com- William and Harold are really common names. <laughs> mm-hmm. So anyway, when Canute dies, he's got this wife, Elfgifu of Northampton, who's got these two boys, Harold and Swain. He's also got Emma, who's got her half of Canute, who's, who's really got the strongest claim, I suppose. But then there's also, still in exile, wait, been waiting there for years, is her sons by her now grown-up sons. Edward and Alfred. Alfred and Edward, who becomes the confessor, yeah. So there's actually... And Godwin is powerful too. And, well, exactly. And so Godwin is now the most powerful man in the land. What, in terms of troops? Yeah, in terms of wealth, troops, influence. He's sort of a kingmaker figure, it seems, uh, by this stage. Not entirely. It's not like he can just install himself or one of his sons or anything like that yet. It's not like he can just pick whoever he wants and they're just his puppet. But among the magnates... He's the most powerful. Among the great elder men of England, he's the most powerful, yeah. So what happens is Emma, it seems, doesn't even really consider Edward, the confessor, or his young brother Alfred, to sort of get them over and have the old house of Wessex, the old ancient family line come back. There's no real question, it seems, in anyone's mind that that's going to happen. It's just a straight-up duke-out between Harthur Canute, Emma's son, and uh, Harold, Harold Harefoot. What had happened is, before Canute had died, he'd sent, he'd sent Swain 
and Harold Harefoot over to Scandinavia, one to rule as regent of Denmark and one to rule as regent of Norway. Whilst Hartha Canute, the idea, we, they think, was that Hartha Canute would inherit England. Right. Um, but, you know, when he dies unexpectedly, <laughs> without leaving any proper, anything in writing to say who he wanted to succeed him or anything like that, um, they just face off against each other. But In England, all of them. Well, England. no, that's the thing. Hartha Canute had been sent to Denmark and was, was reigning as regent in Denmark when Canute dies. Harold Harefoot is in England. On the spot. Now, this story, what happens, gets played out a a few more times, almost exactly. Whoever's on the spot has got a massive advantage um, because they're able to just sort of force themselves to have a coronation. They're able to seize the royal treasury. They're able to coerce the magnates around them more directly and more quickly than any other rivals that are overseas. And that's what happens. Harold Harefoot is able to sort of install himself not as absolute undisputed ruler yet but he has the upper hand from the off Hartha Knut is over in Denmark and having some troubles there there's there's other Vikings out there that are sort of taking him on so he hasn't he's not actually in a good spot right now to just come over and claim his his English throne and and fight his half-brother Harold so it's under this period that Godwin you know really comes into the story for what he decides to do at first, he backs Hartha Canute, and Hartha Canute is, of course, backed by his mum, Emma. So Emma, there's like a faction which is pro Hartha Canute, and for a while, they're able to, with Godwin's help, able to say that, look, the, the south of England, everything below the Thames, the old House of Wessex, will rule this in Hartha Canute's name, and Harold can control everything north of that, and... We'll wait and see what happens. It's a funny sort of holding position. It's not really very precedent. It didn't really happen after this time. There's like a weird holding pattern, hoping that Hartha Canute is going to come over and there'll be, there may or may not be a decisive battle, but one way or another it will get sorted out. But what happens is Hartha Canute doesn't come over for years. He's just not in a position to. So what happens is Harold's faction becomes stronger and stronger. And he calls himself king... Yeah, 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 he calls himself king, yeah. He's not known as Harefoot until a couple of hundred years later, historians in the Middle Ages call him that. This thing about this Harold Harefoot is very, very little is known about him. We're in the Dark Ages, as I keep saying, but there's very little written about him. Uh, One historian I read said, we know, he's the king we know least about, including ones 400 years before this. So anyway, he's he's a bit of an interesting figure. His elder brother, Swain just dies at some point so he's sort of out of the story but he would have been an important figure he had he not died but he does so yeah it's really like a showdown between the two camps and um, and they can see apparently historians can see from coins coinage who was minting what when and in what volumes and you can sort of see half the canutes coins become fewer and fewer and are of poorer and poorer quality and the opposite for harold's coins and it comes to the point where, um, in the end, Harold is able to take everything, seize everything. Soon into his reign, in like 1036, he took all of Emma's money. He went to the royal treasury in Winchester, where she sort of was, and um, sort of took it for himself. Because technically he was sort of the over-king, but she was sort of an acting regent for the absent Hartha Canute. But that sort of power dynamic is destined to fall apart, isn't it? Yeah. And eventually it does. And she has to... Uh, but but it's interesting that she's 50-odd by this point and is a key, key, key player. I mean, I haven't really gone into a great detail about that, of what sort of character she must have been, but she must have been a formidable human being. She must have been. Had her own mind, a really strong... Stood up, to, stood up to kings and stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, and 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 outwitted them often, like uh, just endlessly hatching plans. And who wins this this standoff between Godwin, Harold, and her? And okay, yeah. So what happens is she eventually is forced to flee because Harold, Harefoot, has become has sort of won the struggle. And interestingly, as I mentioned, she doesn't go back to Normandy. She flees to Flanders. 
which is controlled by uh, Baldwin V at that point. Um, and she ends up in Bruges. He puts her up in uh, very nice surroundings in Bruges. But something happened just before this. I need to go back and explain it because it is important. Before this, Emma had turned to her other sons. You know, it looked like Arthur Canute wasn't going to come over. We don't know when he's going to come over, if ever. So she's sort of getting desperate. So she does turn to her uh, sons by Ethelred. Right. Who are grown men by now. Had grown up, basically, in the Norman court. Were, were the same age, roughly, as the Duke, Duke Robert. And she turns to them and obviously tries to get them to have a shot at invading England. So the story goes that the young Edward the Confessor goes across, like has a small, relatively small navy with a, a, an, an army and lands in the south of England and has a battle that he wins, but then decides, oh, he couldn't possibly... He's not got what it takes to actually take and hold the whole island. So... He just retreats back to Normandy. But some people think that whole thing is made up to make him seem less pathetic <laughs> after he became king. We don't know. But what we do know, or does, or does seem to definitely have happened, was that then, roughly about the same time, maybe just a few weeks or months after that, his younger brother Alfred attempts the exact same thing. But he gets captured by Godwin, or by Godwin's faction. And he gets imprisoned and blinded. Now, that was a thing the, in those days. It was sort of a Byzantine punishment that if you were ever blinded, that, or the rationale was that if you were blind, there's no way you could ever rule. A ruler would, by definition, have to have his eyesight. So by blinding you, they were just robbing you of any future power, really. Same with cutting off your hands or cutting off your nose. If you'd been mutilated in any way, their idea was that a king or an emperor was sort of unsullied. <laughs> So if you'd had your nose and ears chopped off, then there's no way that your court would ever accept you back. And this is sort of an idea that um, the Vikings and the Normans and the Anglo-Saxons and everyone really took up. And it was also funny, a, a bit of a no-no to kill royal royalty. Of course, they did it whenever they had to. But if you could sort of avoid it, if you could just maim the claimant to the throne, then, then God wouldn't be as annoyed with you because you hadn't killed him. Uh, you yeah, know, taken his life. Yeah, yeah. Mm. but the problem with the problem with maiming people, especially in those days, is it quite often did kill them anyway. If you were blinded, it could kill you. If you were castrated, it could quite often, you, you could bleed out easily. And anyway, that's what happened to this Alfred. They blinded him, but a few weeks later, he died of the wounds. So, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is pretty clear that the Bishop of uh, Worcester, I think, and and Godwin. Is, are, were responsible for it and this becomes an issue later so it seems like this uh, Harold Harefoot is now basically undisputed king of England and Emma the endless hatcher of plots is in Bruges hatching plans and she sends a letter to Edward the later confessor saying look you know do something help and he apparently says I can't you saw what just happened to Alfred but then Hartha can you comes out of the wilderness he finally puts down the other vikings that are contending with him up in scandinavia um there's a magnus there's a guy called magnus up there swain estrithson they've got great names (laughs) as well hartha canute is finally in a position in like 1040 to come over and try his luck he first sort of tries to meet up or does meet up with emma in Flanders, he, he has got a, a fleet of 62 ships, but he f- first turns up with just 10. And they think, oh, that's not going to be enough. But Sorry, go on, you going to say something? Uh, did, did Emma flee to Flanders because Normandy didn't want her, like, denied her refuge? Well, I'm not 100%, well, I don't think would anyone's been, 100% sure of why. Would but she have drawn trouble to Normandy? Otherwise? Yeah, it, well, it's all sorts of things. Yeah, you have to sort of read between the lines. It would have been possibly the Duke of Normandy doesn't want her, she's too much trouble. Possibly that it's to do with... Ruling classes of Flanders and the ruling class of Normandy have, were always fairly close. So it's not... Straight away, it's not crazy. Hmm. But yeah, it's not 100% sure... We're not 100% sure exactly why... I wonder if... That happened. Maybe uh, maybe the Duke of Normandy... Was it Robert? Yeah. Maybe he wanted to marry Edward. Yeah, maybe Robert intended to somehow get one of his daughters or something 
a claim on England via Edward, via like by marriage to Edward the Confessor or something. Yeah, maybe quite possibly, he didn't yeah. want to lose Edward to to Emma. Yeah, quite possibly, quite possibly. <laughs> but uh, I can only speculate. Really. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's kind of why it's good and interesting because you, you can use your imagination quite a lot. Mm-hmm. But it's also frustrating because you want to know for sure. Yeah, you want to know for real. Yeah, for reals. So Arthur can you rocks up in Bruges in 1040 with only 10 ships that also nearly get sunk in a storm. And it's like, oh God, this doesn't bode well. But then he does eventually gather a fleet of more like 62 ships. And then Harold Harefoot just dies out of nowhere. Again, another, just it just happens. Now this one, it seems there may have been, it could have been a poisoning. But again, it looks like probably not. It seems from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and from reading between the lines that um, it took everyone unawares, that no one particularly had been planning, like plotting to poison him or anything, and he just sort of dies. Which leaves it open for Hartha Canute to just hop across and just take the throne, uh, unopposed, which is basically what he does. And Emma is restored as the, the, the mum the of queen the, mother. the Queen Mother. Yeah, the Queen Mother, the King Mother. So she's back... To like not the dizzying heights of Queen or, or even or even like Regent, but you know she's back right at the apex of power. The in the heart of yeah the, the yeah yeah oh yeah 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 she resides at Winchester quite a lot. I'm given to understand it seems so she's right there and um, and just you know pulling levers and stuff <laughs> actually buying people right? actually um, doing the business of government to some extent. But the thing is, um, Canute, oh sorry, Hartha Canute, Hartha Canute, it seems, is uh, just a prick, <laughs> <laughs> just an idiot, like just a vengeful, violent knob who's not interested in governing or anything, who's only interested, in fact, in wringing as much money as he possibly can out of the country. Like we had, uh, or Britain had, England had, a, a form of taxation mainly for raising, mainly for buying or creating ships to defend themselves from Vikings, mainly. And it certainly wasn't a tax that normal people had to pay or anything like that. Mm-hmm. But there was some way to levy money the Crown could do. And um, it had gone way, all the way back to Alfred the Great, you know, a few hundred years earlier. So, But this Hartha Canute just, just rinses it, just takes it to a whole new level. Uh, there was one example when one of some town somewhere... I can't remember where it was, Berry or something. Somewhere refused to pay it, or or they even tried to kick the the tax collectors out of their town. And so Hartha Canute just turns up with an army and just raises the whole town. If is that sort of guy, right. a much more in the sort of Viking um, mould. Well, he would have grown up under Canute, obviously, like partly yeah. in England, partly in Denmark. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and a lot in Denmark. So he um, sounds like he probably preferred the Danish way. Maybe, yeah, quite possibly. He seems like a, he seems like more of a Viking than anything else, to me anyway. Yeah. That's, uh, so, for example, when he comes over, he has Harold's body, Harold Harefoot's body, dug up. It had been, um, it had been, uh, <laughs> you know, it had been buried properly and everything. And the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle says that Harold had the body quote flung into a fen. End quote. <laughs> Just that. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, that is why I like this period, is because you're just given a, a hint of what happened, you know, mm. just a suggestion of something that might have happened, and that's it, and you're, you, all you've got is your imagination to fill in the blanks, which is, like I say, both great and frustrating, but mainly great <laughs> to yeah. me. Oh, yeah. it, it, his body may have been flung in the Thames and someone else fished it out and gave it a decent burial, but we don't know. Um, <laughs> We're at what year when he dies? Oh, oh, sorry. Hartha so Hartha Canute dies in 1042. Um, so his reign is short. It's only a couple of years long. Yeah. And and what happens is about a year into his reign, he, inv- it's a weird episode this, but he invites seemingly of his own volition, invites Edward, his half brother, who he's probably never met, invites him over to England to be a joint ruler with him. For him, what, intending for him to take over? We don't know. Like, after he died? Then. We don't know. Hmm. So, it's really odd. 
to do that. Would he? Well, um, is that because he acknowledged Edward as the rightful? We don't king? know. No, no, he was the main king. You know how you would have uh, a Caesar and an Augustus. The Augustus was the the senior partner, and the Caesar was a junior partner. Uh, it was, they think maybe it would have been something like that. He was still the main king. <laughs> yeah. But Edward the Confessor would be his his Caesar, if you like, his second in command. His for legitimacy. Well, we don't know. So this period, we don't know why Find it out. was. <laughs> but historians think. Well, the one is the historians I have heard or read, which seems most plausible to me, was that Arthur Canute was ill. Right. He um, was really ill. And okay. it, they thought that he might die at any moment, sort yeah. of thing. Mm. So you need a backup if you can. So the idea. Now that makes sense. And then he just remained ill for like a year until he died. But there's other accounts where, that say no, he was he was perfectly well up until the end. So it's a really weird period, and uh, and we don't really know why it was done, and whether Emma had much to do with it, whether Godwin had anything to do with it, Emma or the Duke of Normandy. Have an interest in that, obviously. Yeah. That was like her next best bet. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Yeah. 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 Alfred was dead. Mm-hmm. Who else was there? For her, no, yeah. that was it. You're yeah. right. And it's best. It makes sense for the kingdom as well. But remember, yeah. then now here's where it gets a little bit. Well, so so Arthur Canute does just die of um, a, a disease. It seems no foul play. He wasn't murdered. They don't think in 1042, which leaves Edward the Confessor as sole ruler. But don't you remember Godwin murdered his little brother just a few years earlier, uh-huh. blinded him and had him murdered. So now you've got Edward the Confessor and his mum, who's obviously on his side, against Godwin, the most powerful magnate in the land, and he'd murdered her son and his brother. So So it was difficult. <laughs> so for the he now he claimed Godwin just claimed, look, I was doing it under I was under orders <laughs> just like at Nuremberg, I was under orders from uh, Harold, Harold Herefoot at the time. So what was that probably true? I don't know, probably. I mean, it seems likely. Um, I don't know. One book I read said that Godwin had changed sides before... Changed sides from Arthur Canute to Harold Harefoot before Alfred tried to invade. So the the excuse that you're simply following orders doesn't necessarily hold water, if you believe that. But again, I don't know. Nobody really knows for sure. But what they all seem to agree is that he did murder him. So anyway... The whole of the Confessor's reign is sort of a struggle with Godwin and then later his son, Godwinson, Harold Godwinson, or Godwine, sometimes they say, Godwin or Godwine. Yeah, his whole reign is a struggle with him. Um, I won't go into detail because I'm not not really interested in that for this video, but at different points they sort of exile each other. Like at one point, (laughs) Godwine is completely out of favour and is forced to flee. Uh, and then he comes back and the king is forced to accept him back like through gritted teeth and then and at another point Godwin gets the upper hand so utterly that Edward the Confessor is basically just a, his puppet and it ebbs and flows this this really interesting relationship but just to finish up on Emma I mean she's getting on now she's sort of mid 50s sort of knocking 60 odd by the time Edward the Confessor comes to the throne the Confessor himself is in his 30s by the way, he isn't known as Edward the Confessor during his lifetime. I'm just saying that so everyone knows who I'm talking about. But in the encomium, it says uh, the fact that this Edward the Confessor is now returned, the legitimate son of the deposed Ethelred the Unready. Mm. The encomium says, quote, The will had turned full circle. Against all odds, England's ancient royal house had been miraculously restored. End quote. Which says it perfectly. It, okay, the whole thing of Canute and Swain Forkbeard and all the Viking invasions had all been sort of washed away to some extent by getting Edward Confessor back on the throne. But of course now that Anglo-Saxon aristocracy had all been killed a generation, nearly a generation ago. So it was all new people. So historians love to say that in 1066 at the Battle of Hastings the, the Anglo-Saxon world was, was killed off. I was like, no, that already happened. <laughs> that already happened in like 1016, 1017. Um, that was just a new wave of Anglo-Saxons that were uh, done we away with in 1066. The, 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 the real ones <laughs> uh, were long gone already. From, 
Swain and Canute. Swain and then Canute's um, uh, purges mm. um, after he gets in in sort of 1016, 1017. That's when all the the real old Anglo-Saxon aristocracies, all the big families were sort of done away with. But Emma isn't done. Her story isn't done. That's why she's such a fascinating character that her whole life, other than her childhood, is eventful. It just doesn't really stop. <laughs> So Edward the Confessor's reign, as as we all know, is is long. He's uh, he's depicted as a, a white haired, white bearded old man in in the in the tapestry, in the Bayeux tapestry, which incidentally isn't a tapestry; it's an embroidery. But <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> but right at the beginning of his reign, in the year ten forty three, something happens. From Mark Morris again, I'll quote: "Before the same year was out, however." Edward would discover that certain people had already failed him. In mid-November 1043, continues the chronicle, the king went to Winchester and deprived his mother Emma of all her possessions, both lands and treasure, all that she owned in gold and silver, and things beyond description. That was the Anglo-Saxon chronicle. Morris goes on to say, Given her treatment of him since his childhood, Edward might be thought to have acted simply out of long-standing resentment, and indeed, one version of the Chronicle explains the king's actions by saying that his mother had been very hard on him in the past. But it also goes on to imply that Emma had offered her son, that Emma had offended her son far more recently, saying she did less for him than he wished, both before he became king and afterwards as well. The real reason Edward had taken offence in 1043 is illuminated incidentally in A Saint's Life, written later in the century. While the king was reigning in peace, like Solomon, it says, his own mother was accused of having incited the king of the Norwegians, who was called Magnus, to invade England, and of having given countless of her treasures to him, as well as her support. Wherefore this traitor to the kingdom, enemy of the country, betrayer of her son, was judged, and all of her property was forfeited to the king. Morris goes on. Some modern historians have dismissed this story as nothing more than rumour, pointing out that within a year Emma had apparently been pardoned and at least partially rehabilitated. But whether the former queen was guilty or not, the notion that Edward suspected her of treason accords perfectly with his actions, as described by the Chronicle, where the king is seen to act as a result of information he has only just received, racing to Winchester and catching his mother unawares. He also reportedly confronted her in considerable force, taking with him all three of his major earls and their military followers. This was clearly not a cold dish of revenge, but a heated response to a breaking crisis. Moreover, the notion that Emma might have made overtures to Magnus of Norway was far from being an absurd conspiracy. She was a serial hatcher of plots. End quote. So what incentives would she have to scheme with Magnus? Yeah, I've, I've thought about that often. Who, it's not who, quite clear, and I don't have a good answer for you. There may be one out there, but I haven't found it. Who was he to her? I don't... Not much, I don't think. <laughs> it seems like... Could have been a false plot. Could Who knows? That That is the thing about any period of history when there's very little evidence. You can, if you want, create all sorts of stories of what it may or may not have been. It's um, good for historical fiction. Yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah. I don't know, I get the feeling that Emma of Normandy just didn't care much about Edward, the Confessor. Or she was like his last... He was her last resort. Uh, I'm not sure. But she basically... um, That is one of her last important actions on on stage, if you like. She dies in 1052 of old age. Basically, she's 65 plus, which is really old for those days. What, like internal exile or something? Yeah, basically, well, no, I mean, she's, they say she's partially returned to favour, but it's just never really allowed her own, her own treasury again. It's just, they just keep an eye on her, you know. So, yeah, but basically she must have been an incredible person, a, a very, very strong character. There's some women in history that are able to just hang with the men, <laughs> if not surpass them in terms of savagery and uh, malevolence or uh, duplicity. Or, or just smarts, you know. You don't die of old age in that world playing the games she was playing unless you can do it well. When you when you look at what was it? She became queen consort in first in what year was it? Ten ten o two when she first married Ethelred. So you look at from that period, right? Well, well, from when was the first full invasion by the Danes like Swain? You can say 
Fork beard, yeah, in uh, 1013. I kind of see what happened between then, what, between her becoming queen and the conquest of William the Bastard. Yeah. As, as a sort of sequence where Swain and, well, probably from Malden or before, like, the, the Danes came in and smashed apart Anglo-Saxon in England. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, well, shortly after, she planted the Norman seed. <laughs> In very sort of like dug up ground, like <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, um, absolutely, it was dug up ground, yes, yeah. because I think you, well, I look at the invasion of Swain and Canute as the last of, or very nearly the last of the of the role of the Vikings. Yeah, in English yeah, mm-hmm. I mean there were Viking scares, a really big one in the age of William the Conqueror, and I believe even. In the age of, let's see, Stephen, even in the age of Stephen and Matilda, there was suggestions that Vikings might come over. So it didn't, it didn't just go away, but the, the last great push that was successful anyway was Canute. But it goes back so much longer than that. Like, mm. you know, the first Viking invasions of, you know, like Lindisfarne and stuff, it's like the 7th century? Or no, 6th century even. It goes way back. It goes way, way back. Um, so, you know, Bede, the Venerable Bede of Jarrow, the Monk of Jarrow, talks all about this. And he dies in, like, 750-something. So, yeah, it goes way back. The, the, the Canute is really the the pinnacle of, uh, or the zenith, if, if you like, of, of the Vikings' ability to screw over the British Isles. But they do do it thoroughly. Uh, when they do eventually do it. I mean, back in sort of 954 is when the Anglo-Saxons were able to retake York off of the Vikings. So the... Oh, they've been quite... Uh, that had been settled by a lot of Vikings yeah, as well. Yeah, what well, they could not Dane... Dane... I can't even think of Danegeld, which is the money. What not was it? Dane Law. Yeah, the Dane Law. Yes, the Dane Law. So that is, you know, old... <laughs> by the age of Canute, really old by the age of William the Conqueror. And it's another thing, when people talk about the Norman invasion of William the Bastard, uh, as if there was like this, these foreigners from Normandy that came out of nowhere, that <laughs> just that just took yeah. completely just against the will of... Force, yeah, it's, it's much more nuanced and complicated than that. It, in my opinion, William the Bastard, even though being a bastard, <laughs> i.e. not entirely legitimate, still had a far better claim to the throne of England than Harold Godwinson, who was merely the son of a peasant who had done really well under a Viking usurper. I mean, he I had no royal blood. Harold I've, Godwinson was not royal in any way. But I can see how it's, it's natural to, uh, to want to uh, believe Harold's claim was better because he was more English. Well, yeah, that's another thing uh, some historians I've seen talk about how... A lot of, or certainly English people, are raised usually to see the Anglo-Saxons as the goodies, as us. Yeah. And the Normans as the baddies, as them, as the frogs, as the Frenchies. Well, I do but, see, I, I see it that way. The Anglo-Saxons well, and that the Celts was certainly are how the goodies. I, yeah. That was certainly how I was raised, and I can't see it the other way round. No, I don't, I don't um, cheer for the Normans no, at all. No, not at all. But when you look at it, as I mentioned, you know, just really clearly, Harold Godwinson wasn't anything to do with the royal family of Wessex or anything. Mm-hmm. But then you could say William was just the great-great-great-grandson, or whatever it was, of Rollo, who was just a, a Viking adventurer. So he's got no royal blood either. 